So it's been only since the last century that women have had voting rights. It's funny how people aren't surprised by the breaking down of a 40,000 year old patriarchy, but find the prospect of the demise of a mere 200 year old capitalism somehow unbelievable. Yet it's something that's already happening right before us as a society moves from a capitalist era to a collaboratist one. So why and how is this decline happening? Well, the central argument of the book is that there lies a contradiction at the heart of the capitalist theory. Now classical economic theory goes like this. Once there's a market for something and a firm introduces its product, sooner or later a new firm enters the market with a newer technology that boosts productivity and cuts costs and this process of new firms entering the market and bringing down prices continues. Prices drop because with increased productivity, which can be something as simple as cutting middlemen and slashing transactional costs, the marginal cost of the product, which is the cost of producing an additional unit of the product once the fixed upfront costs have been covered, goes down. As such, the holy grail of capitalism must be a zero or near zero marginal cost society because, well, that's the definition of peak productivity or its height of achievement. Besides this, capitalism is under siege on two additional fronts. The first has to do with it not paying enough attention to the laws of physics. Well, let me explain. The first law of thermodynamics means that the total energy in the universe cannot be altered. And the second law requires that with any activity, energy can only be turned from usable to useless. This now dispersed energy is labeled entropy. Quoting the author, Whatever energy is embedded in the product or service is at the expense of energy used and lost, the entropic bill in moving the economic activity along the value chain. And the entropic bill for the last 200 years of ruthless economic activity has arrived. So what does it look like? Well, its name is climate change and the bill comprises of, among other things, an accelerated destruction of the biosphere on all fronts with ever-increasing carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide emissions. So in other words, capitalism as we know it is no longer sustainable. The second way capitalism is being threatened is the rising Internet of Things, an infrastructure for the third industrial revolution if we call it. So back to basics, what does a society need in terms of infrastructure to be functional? Well, it's three elements, energy, communication and logistics which are about creating, managing, and moving economic activity across the value chain, respectively. During the first industrial revolution, the infrastructure comprised of the steam engine, steam printing, and the telegraph. Then the second industrial revolution brought with it a shift to oil, the internal combustion engine, and the telephone. Now a third industrial revolution is underway. This time, it's made up of the energy internet, communications internet, and logistics internet. We'll go into the details of each one shortly, but you might have a question at this point. So okay, in theory all this looks pretty neat and logical, but how do we actually know that this is already happening anyway? Well, take a look around you. No matter where you live, you can testify to this one since you are watching this video. The communications internet has already brought down the marginal cost of sharing information and entertainment to zero for billions of people over the world. The near zero marginal cost is a reality for millions of early adopters with the energy and logistics internet too. In many developed nations, consumers are becoming prosumers, meaning they are producing their own goods besides consuming them. The name for this rising phenomena is 3D printing. Quoting the author, a 3D printing process embedded in an internet of things infrastructure means that virtually anyone in the world can become a prosumer, producing his or her own products for user sharing employing open source software. The production process itself uses one tenth of the material of conventional manufacturing and requires very little labor in the making of the product. The energy used in the production is generated from renewable energy harvested on site or locally at near zero marginal cost. The product is marketed on global marketing websites again at near zero marginal cost. Lastly, the product is delivered to users in e-mobility transport powered by locally generated renewable energy again at near zero marginal cost. And that pretty well sums up what this new infrastructure will look like. Speaking of the switch to green renewable energy, in the developed nations, its solar homes and buildings, 
and millions of small and mid-sized businesses and non-profits being born thereof. In the developing countries, it's the concept of microgrids, powered by the sun and the wind, again all available and harnessed locally and communally. And especially since the Great Recession, perhaps due to diminished trust in the government and business leaders, people are increasingly sharing their homes, cars and even clothes, which is to say that ownership is becoming less important than access. All this also means that markets are giving way to networks and self-interest is giving way to collaborative interests. We are moving from property rights to open source, from privacy to transparency, and from a search for autonomy to a search for community. Even in higher education, there is increasing penetration of massive open online courses, service learning, and a shared community-based learning experience, both online and offline. The universities are making the same mistake as the entertainment industry at the dawn of the internet. Music artists, with their works being shared for free on the internet, hope to get a fraction of those potential customers to at least pay for their live concerts. I don't know how much that happened, but at least with the universities, they might increasingly see their role decline toward a more circumscribed and supplementary one in the future. They thought that by making their courses available for free to millions, even billions, they could invite some of these students, the best and the rich, to attend them on campus to sustain their brick and mortar business. But then what's to prevent a university from accepting a MOOC certification as credits for a very small fee? And that's just one of the problems right here. Even granted any marginal value these universities might exact on so many students, the same will be dwarfed by the loss of revenue to the network of higher education as a whole. When the marginal cost of teaching a given course to the hundred thousandth student online is otherwise zero. Perhaps the question for universities is no longer who will implement these changes, but who will implement them first. Coming to the job market, the near zero marginal cost phenomena is finding its application to human labor as well. The elimination of white collar jobs is keeping pace with that of blue collar ones. Think how many file clerks, telephone operators, bank tellers, cashiers, travel agents and secretaries you find nowadays. Yes, we are in the middle of an epic change in the nature of work. What the first industrial revolution did to slave and serve labor, and what the second industrial revolution did to agricultural and craft labor, the third industrial revolution is doing to mass wage labor and salaried professional labor. Even speaking of a non-obvious example like the wireless broadcast spectrum, technologies are turning it from a scarce resource to an abundant one, and deflating costs of gene sequencing mean we are heading toward democratization of research just as we have it with green energy, 3D printing, information and online college courses. While the marginal cost controversy isn't exactly new, it's only now that the questions of finding a financing model and a governance model for this new economy have become one of the most important political issues facing us. Because these decisions are going to determine our collective social, economic and political life for the rest of the century and can either help or forever hinder the transition to the collaboratist era. And the author is in no way naive about how this shift is going to occur. He touches on the already induced global warming and cyber terrorism, the two major threats to the transition, even if we do everything right from here. Anyway, now assuming you found all this change to be credible, it's actually verifiable, you might be wondering why the heck do we even have capitalism in the first place? Well, in short, it was just circumstantial relevance, if you look at the birth of capitalism. So at first there used to be a feudal society in medieval Europe. Long story short, with the coming of print and wind and water mills, the power of urban craftsmen and merchants matched those of the feudal lords. Guilds were started by the craftsmen, but the merchants and entrepreneurs began outsourcing to cheaper labor in the rural areas and also automation with the new technologies. Now obviously, they needed market expansion both for and domestic for their much cheaper goods. The mercantilist policies won, though after much opposition leading up to the breaking of the American colonies with England in 1776 and the French Revolution, eventually putting us in the era of a free market economy. But it wasn't until the late 18th century that capitalism was really born, with the introduction of steam power. And even here, it was the precise dynamics of the situation that rendered every other mode of economic activity inefficient. So for instance, the upstart costs during both the first industrial revolution with laying railroads and the second industrial revolution with extracting oil were tremendous. 
the small family-owned businesses of the simple market economy era preceding capitalism were simply incapable of covering these costs. That gave rise to the need for the modern stockholding corporation, and so a new form of enterprise emerged where the worker no longer owned the tools he would use to create the product, and the investor would no longer control the day-to-day -day affairs of the enterprise, thus separating the concepts of ownership, possession, and control for the first time. Besides, managing these new industries could be most efficiently carried out using a top-down, centralized command and control structure in a vertically integrated company which brought everything from manufacturing and suppliers to sales and customers under a single roof. In this way, these companies were able to cut middlemen transactional costs, increase productivity throughout the entire operation of the enterprise, and build out their economies of scale to both recoup their upfront investments and eventually profit by selling these cheaper goods to the masses and in the process improving the lives of the millions of customers and of the hard workers. It's worth noting though that the economic shift to capitalism would not have been possible without an accompanying paradigm shift or worldview change that was brought about by the Enlightenment philosophers and a misinterpreted ideology that favors competition and autonomy over cooperation and community, now commonly known as social Darwinism. Coming to the present, a lot of social work has been going on in the name of reform you know, feminism, environmentalism, animal rights, and fair trade activism. Now one might wonder what's the common thread that unites these all. And if one looks enough closely, one will find that much of this effort has to do with simply reclaiming the commons. Now what is the commons? Okay, a commons is anything that is held in common and is collectively managed rather than privately owned. So the air, water, oceans, environment, the public square, parts of the virtual cyberspace like Wikipedia, Basically anything which is jointly or communally managed and with a set of mutually agreed formal or informal protocols, which economists tend to ignore by the way in their description of the commons, leading to the misconclusion that it is something inherently unsustainable, in part for example due to free riders. But commons is how we have survived before the industrial era and how we are going to mostly live in the post-industrial era if we are going to survive at all. The industrial era has been primarily about the enclosure of one common after another and so reclaiming the commons, this has been the missing overarching narrative common to all these social and environmental efforts of the late. And this is also true of the free software movement, not to mention the growing influence of copyleft, open source and the birth of the creative commons. So where is the origin of this growing interest in the commons? It has to be the case that socialism and bureaucratic government on the one hand and ruthless capitalism on the other made room for a third option and the rising infrastructure, chiefly the internet until now, handed the alternative to millions and eventually billions of people to create a viable governing structure from the bottom up, and hence followed the rebirth of the commons. People got disenchanted by the government and business communities, and especially with something as the Great Recession of 2008, people realized that they had accumulated too much stuff they didn't need, with money they didn't have, and they were even losing their jobs now despite increasing productivity, thanks in part to automation with IT, AI and robotics. And all of this was happening during a time when our ecosystems were being severely taxed as well. And so in a wake-up call, people basically realized that something had gone awfully wrong with the system. As such, there's clearly an element of inevitability in this shift we are witnessing right here. And so as Jeremy Rifkin's notes, who could be opposed to the idea of collaborative consumption at a sharing economy? These new economic models seem so benign. Sharing represents the best part of human nature, reducing addictive consumption, optimizing frugality, and fostering a more sustainable way of life is not only laudable, but essential if we are to ensure our survival. In fact, after reading this book, I'll go as far as to say that if we are assuming we are gonna still exist by the turn of the century, Saving nuclear war, of course, and assuming we don't colonize Mars, which seems unlikely in the short to midterm, then what you are assuming is that this shift will occur. There's just no way we could keep destroying the planet and also make it past this century living on Earth. And as for the required paradigm shift, we'll need the most inclusive, what the author calls biosphere consciousness, that is thankfully emerging in the younger generations. So overall, this is a precious book to read, I mean especially during a time when almost everyone, and this is true no matter where you happen to live, almost everyone can confirm that all I've just said is so true. 
The book offers the much needed hope for those who are sick and tired of the prejudices and atrocities of the old system and the much needed guidance to those who have the guts to actually build out this new thing. Of course, capitalism won't disappear overnight. Rather, the market will play an increasingly dominant role in a predominantly social economy. But the future of jobs and businesses will be nothing like what we have had until now. You know, if I had to sum up what I learned in this book in a sentence, it would be this. In the beginning, we had a sustainable society. At present, we have a smart one. In the future, we'll have a society that's, that is both smart and sustainable. But yes, there are roadblocks and obstacles ahead, and all sorts of precautions and careful stewardship are required. But it's up to us to choose what kind of society we'll live in and pass on to the future generations. And it matters that we choose carefully.